If you look up fire extinguisher compatibility charts online, they'll often only talk about class A, B, C, E and F fires. So what is a class D fire? How do we start one? And how do we put it out? Why was this fire extinguisher $2,000? And, and why haven't I finished my thesis yet? Yeah, good day. Eh? Welcome back to another episode of Explosions and Fire. If we consider the periodic table, most of the elements are metals, right? And most of the metals are flammable. Most of them aren't very flammable, so they have to be a fine powder or heated to a high temperature. But most metals will react with oxygen and, and sort of burn at some point. And what's more exciting is when you have a metal that's so reactive, when you have that burning metal and you put water on it, rather than the fire going out, the fire actually intensifies and you generate hydrogen, which is a big explosion hazard. So that's a D metal fire, right? So if you take any of these elements and they're burning and you put water on it, rather than extinguishing it, it will only fuel the fire. There's quite a few of these elements that are capable of causing a class D fire, and a lot of them aren't very surprising though. Like you've got all this group one elements like sodium and potassium and cesium that are very reactive with water at room temperature. So of course the fire is also going to be reactive with water. And you've got all these lanthanide metals at the bottom which aren't really real elements and are just a conspiracy to keep employing more physics PhD students. What I think are the most interesting elements in this group are the metals that are really stable at room temperature, both the air and water, but once they get in a fire, get really carried away and you can't use water on them. Theoretically, you could build a building out of these elements and it would be perfectly stable if extremely hazardous in some circumstances. But the bulk material is not really considered to be a fire hazard unless you're really trying to set it on fire. Let's really try to set it on fire. I mean, how hard is it to set these metals on fire? So for some flammability tests, I have plates of three different metals. I've got zinc, magnesium, and titanium. Now, theoretically, all of these are flammable metals, but they're not treated as flammable metals. So what does it take to set them on fire? So the first test we're gonna do is we're just gonna put them under a simple propane blowtorch. Zinc has a melting point of just over 400 degrees, so the propane torch quite readily melts the plate. The zinc does occasionally catch on fire. It burns with quite a brilliant blue flame. The fire doesn't really go on to consume the whole sheet of metal, but just the fact that zinc has such a low melting point doesn't really matter how big a bulk block of zinc is. In any fire scenario, the zinc is probably going to melt and, and cause a huge hazard. Magnesium has a melting point of 650 degrees, which is probably on the upper temperature range of what the blowtorch can realistically achieve. It's also quite a big bit of metal, so it takes a while for the blowtorch to get it up to a reasonable temperature. The weirdly colored footage is from a thermal camera that I have now. The maximum temperature that this thermal camera can read is about 650 degrees. So if it reports a temperature of like 700 or 750, it's not accurately reading out that temperature. It's just screaming in pain because it's looking at something way hotter than it's meant to be. You can probably see where this is going. After about three minutes straight of blowtorching, the uh, magnesium slowly catches on fire and the whole plate has been heated for such a long period of time that once it starts burning, it just consumes the whole block. Magnesium fires are intense. They're not super violent. They don't splatter everywhere, but the amount of light and, and the brightness of that pure white light that comes off it. I was worried about the cameras <laughs> getting their sensors burnt on it. It's that bright, it's amazing. I didn't think we would be able to set this whole block on fire with just a blowtorch, but it burns, it definitely burns. So titanium is definitely one of the metals people refer to when they talk about class D fires. So can we set bulk titanium on fire? Well, the thing that works against us is titanium's melting point is incredibly high, really. Another thing that works against us is that this isn't pure titanium. It's like 90% titanium. This alloy has improved mechanical properties over pure titanium. And while I can't find anything online to confirm this, my guess is that this alloy is less flammable than pure titanium is. As such, the propane torch is not able to set the titanium plate on on fire. Um, it just makes it go these cool colors as the titanium reacts with oxygen in the air and makes this sort of thin film of titanium dioxide, which is kind of cool. But we're here to see fire. How do we set titanium on fire? Now, I was going to go out and get different blow torches and step through different gases and get hotter flames, but I think it's only fair we just immediately jump to extreme measures. If we're talking generating extreme temperatures, my thought immediately is thermite. I'm sure all you pyromaniacs out there already know what thermite is. It's just a mixture of iron oxide and aluminium. 
But what's significant about thermite is that there's no gases generated in the reaction. In most pyrotechnic reactions, you generate hot gases and those gases disperse, which sends your heat away. We don't have that in a thermite. In fact, the reaction product we generate is molten iron and that iron retains all the heat. The aluminum oxide doesn't leave either. So you get just molten slag. But the thermite on the titanium plate does not light it on fire at all. In fact, apart from the, all the molten iron sticking to the plate, the plate is completely fine. So we weren't able to damage it even remotely with the thermite. So what, what else have we got? Um, well, something I've always wanted to try is Thermate. Thermate is apparently just like the weaponized version of thermite. Instead of just having the aluminium and the iron oxide, you've also got some barium nitrate and some sulfur. The barium nitrate makes the reaction more intense because you've got an extra oxidizer in there which can consume some of the molten iron. And the little bit of yellow just makes it more unstable and easier to ignite and smell bad. Oh, by the way, this is one of those pyrotechnic recipes I just copied directly from the Wikipedia page. I'm sure every military has their own thermate grenade, and I'm sure every military uses their own special recipe, but someone has just copied this one onto the Wikipedia page, and now it's probably a, a, an intelligence leak if you either confirm or, or deny or correct that recipe on the Wikipedia page. So, <laughs> we'll just assume it's correct. Yeah, I love talking about military stuff because you legally can't correct me on it, even when I'm wrong. So can the Thermate make any impact on the titanium plates? I mean, no, n nothing, nothing at all, really. This is not going that well. Can the Thermite even light the magnesium plate on fire? Yo, thermite sucks at lighting fires, man. What is this? You'd think that molten iron would cause the magnesium to melt, but it's just still completely fine. It's... Thermite is not as good as you think it is. At this point, it would be easy for you to say, why don't I just bloody scale up the thermite and do more thermite? And you make a convincing point. I'm... Let's do that. <laughs> All right, so we have a bit over 100 grams of thermite in this can here. And at the bottom, we've got a titanium plate and a bit of metal on top here. This one is um, magnesium. All right, so we want uh, the magnesium ideally to catch a fire and, and maybe that will help uh, the titanium plate catch on fire if the burning magnesium falls onto the burning titanium. That's kind of the thinking. Um, that's, that's all the thinking that's involved. There's no more thinking than that. Okay, I've also put a square of the zinc metal down as well, just so all the metals can hang out together. They're all friends. You might think it's stupid I've balanced this magnesium plate on top of this aluminium can that's definitely going to melt and then the magnesium plate will just fall off. But you've got to remember that I've studied physics. I, I knew that the magnesium plate would perfectly bounce and put the edge in the fire exactly at a great point for it to catch on fire. The thermite burned for a solid 30 seconds or so, and then once the magnesium plate caught on fire, it burned for the next, I mean, eight minutes. It, it takes a long time to consume that much magnesium. It was a pretty well-controlled metal fire. It only set fire to the grass once, so, uh, you know, I, I, think that's, I think that's okay, all things considered. This is probably not important, but the iron oxide in that thermite reaction used to be cutlery at my grandma's. Is that weird? I don't know, what, does that mean anything? So yeah, we definitely set the magnesium on fire, the magnesium set the zinc on fire, the titanium plate is once again completely fine. Please give me ideas in the comments on how I could set titanium on fire. It must be possible. I want to set the bulk titanium on fire, but for now, I have to declare that it's not flammable. I hate doing that. All right, so we've managed to light some class D fires, but now we have to learn how do we put them out? We have a burning magnesium fire and we don't want it to keep burning. What do we do? How do you put that out? All right, so this is our class D 
fire extinguisher. it. Oh, I'll put it up here. This was about oh, 1500 US dollars, which is quite expensive and, and makes you think that it's filled with some exotic chemical, but in fact, it's actually filled with sodium chloride. <laughs> it really is the world's most expensive salt shaker. The sodium chloride is really inert, so it won't react with the burning metal, which is pretty rare because burning magnesium or burning sodium is very reactive and will react with most things. So sodium chloride is chosen to be unreactive and it's got a very high boiling point. So in the high temperatures of the burning metal, sodium chloride will just melt and form a crust around the metal and stop the metal from reacting with the air. For that to work, the sodium chloride has to be extremely dry and, and that's probably one of the reasons this is so expensive. It's probably just very expensive because it's a critical bit of safety equipment. Those who need it really need it and you need it to work exactly when you want it to. I don't think it's overpriced for <laughs> what it needs to do. If we look at the label here, you see that it is rated to put out a fire of over two kilograms of magnesium, which is quite a lot. <laughs> you need 13 kilos of sodium chloride to uh, be rated to put out, I mean, it's like 2.7 kilos of magnesium. You can put out a decent metal fire, but not a huge one. Oh, it's pretty heavy. <laughs> oh, maybe I'm just weak. Now let's go start a magnesium fire and then put it out with this thing. I'm keen to use it. Although we probably should find somewhere where the grass isn't growing because I feel like we'll end up salting the earth. I don't know how violent this is going to be. So let's go find somewhere that doesn't have so much grass <laughs> before we set this thing off. Fun. All right, it's nearly the end of the video, but we keep talking about putting water on a metal fire, but we don't actually do it. We need to demonstrate these things. Let's put bloody water on a magnesium fire. <laughs> Why not? I want to say thanks to my Patreon supporters for allowing me to light fires and potentially more importantly, allowing me to buy the extinguisher to put out the fires. If you have been suggested to watch this video as part of your training for a new job, consider asking for more hazard pay. Yeah, that's it. Alright, great. <laughs>